In this video, we're going to talk about how we analyze the running time of a loop. So first off, if we have a method and that method just returns a constant, so even though it takes a integer parameter, it returns one no matter what we pass to it, that's a constant time algorithm. Its running time is order one, meaning no matter how big the input is, the output is still going to be calculated in constant time. It doesn't matter how big this array is, it's just going to return one. Now, if we're doing a loop, the loop actually does depend on the size of the array. The more elements in the array, the longer it takes the loop to run. So that would be a linear time algorithm, order n. So those are sort of the two most straightforward values to calculate. But let's see what happens when we have this more complicated method where we have a loop that has a loop inside of it. Now this method still doesn't do anything. It really just counts how many times this line of code gets executed, but it's still similar to something that you may see in practice. So for example, we'll see some sorting algorithms that'll look very similar to this, except we do a little bit of additional work inside the loop. So initially inside this loop with JJ as the index, we increment the counter, which is a constant time operation. And so if we have five elements in our array, we're going to execute that line five times. Hopefully that part makes sense. This is just like what we saw before. This is a linear time loop. However, this outer loop is going to also execute five times because notice both II and JJ both go to the length. So we're going to execute each loop five times. However, since this loop is inside the outer loop, that loop is going to actually be executed five times. So we'll execute that inner loop once, twice, three times, four times, and then finally a fifth time. So what that means is, is we're going to execute that line of code five times in each iteration of the loop that we execute five times. So five times five, ultimately we execute that line 25 times. Now generalizing this for any input, if our length is n, then this is a n times n, which is an n squared algorithm. So it has an asymptotic complexity of n squared. So that's how we calculate the asymptotic complexity of a loop, of a method that contains a loop. Now, suppose we have a loop that looks like this. Before, we just had some constant time stuff. It doesn't matter how many lines of code we have in here. If they're all constant time, we remember we throw away constants when we're doing asymptotic complexity. But here, we have a method. So what we need to know is what is the asymptotic complexity of the method? Now, we would need to go calculate that. But let's just suppose that I've already done that, and we know that the asymptotic complexity is order log n. So now we're going to execute this loop. Each time this loop is executed, do some stuff is called once. Notice though that this is affected by the length of the input because it's going to be called for each number from zero up until the length of the array. If we say our length is going to be five, we call do stuff once, twice, three, four, and then finally a fifth time. Each time do some stuff gets called, we have to do order log n work. So ultimately, if our length is five, we're going to do five times log n work. And actually in this case, n, n would be five. But if we take a general length, it's gonna be n times log n, meaning that we have a method with asymptotic complexity n log n. Don't be too hung up yet on what causes log n to be our asymptotic complexity. We'll actually see examples of that when we get to searching, binary search has log n complexity. And it'll also come into play with sorting when our more efficient sorting algorithms will have asymptotic complexity and log n. So we'll calculate those values later. But for now, just trust that that's what they can be in some cases. Okay, so I've created a file that has examples of methods that have various levels of asymptotic complexity. So we start off with the constant time method we saw before. I created a log time method by, instead of having the loop boundary be the length of the array, it's actually gonna be the log base two of the array. And since the math.log function returns the log base E, I wanna convert that to base two. So I use this to change the base of the log. This counter will get executed log n times. For the linear time method, again, we saw that previously where we just have a for loop. For a quadratic time method, which would be order n squared, then we would have two embedded loops. And the cubic time method, we would have three embedded loops because this is done n times 
this one is done in times, this one is done in times. However, since they're embedded, then it's order n times n times n. So here I have a, a method that has a loop and then calls the log time method inside of the loop. So we're actually calling a, a method inside the loop. We've got to take that into account when we calculate this. So this is log time and we're doing it n times. So we would expect this to be an n log n method. Here we have two loops, one embedded inside the other, where we call our log time method. So in that case, we would expect that to be n squared, n times n, log n. So let's add one more method, just so that there's not any questions about this. So I'm going to modify the cubic time method. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to call, or I should say I'm going to run the for loops consecutively instead of embedding them. And so I'll just call this for loop time method. So we'll see what that becomes. So um, in fact, let's go back and add constant time. Actually, this one's linear time. So here we have order n squared time. And here we have order n cube time. So in this method, we're going to have log times n. So order n log n time. Here we're going to have n times n times log. So order n squared log n time. And then finally, for this last one we saw where we do the loops consecutively, that's actually going to be 3n time, which is order n time, which is linear time algorithm. So in my main method, I generate a random array, and then I call each of those methods in order, printing out the number of iterations, meaning the result that how many times we do that counter. And then I also print the time. Again, with Java, the time is going to always be accurate because there could be other things going on. And of course, the system may change. Let's also add one more because we did that last example. So I'll copy and paste my last one, and I'll just say that this is the, that's the for loop method. Again, each time I get the start time, I call the function, and then I call it get the end time and print that difference at the end. Let's see, where did I call that? For loop time method. Uh, I think I need to just call it for loop method because there's no such thing as for loop time. It's not method two though. And so when I run this code, you can see here's my original array. And then the array is of length 10. So constant time is just one. Log time is three. The log base two of 10 is three. Linear time is 10. Again, we're counting the number of times we get to that key part of the ins most interior piece of the loop. So linear is order n, n is 10, so we get 10 times. Here quadratic is n squared, which is 100. Cubic time, 10 cubed is 1,000. And then if you'll remember, loop method one was n log n. So n log n, if n is 10, is 30. n squared log n, if n is 10, is 300. And then finally, our for loop method was 30. So you may wonder, okay, so is that linear time or quadratic time or cubic time, right? Because if you'll remember, we had three for loops. But in this final case, since we're doing the loops consecutively, we add their time, we don't multiply. When they're embedded loops, then we multiply. So that's a very quick overview of some code that has different running time. So we'll do a lot of examples of these. Don't get too hung up on this. We're going to be analyzing algorithms for the rest of the semester. And for the most part, we're going to be doing those in class together. They're not going to be something you have to do for, as an assignment, but it is something you for you to be aware of because it is an important concept in computer science and definitely one you'll see further down the road.